Well, good morning, everybody. Good morning. Hey, my name is Stephen, and uh, so glad to be back. I was in Indonesia this last week, halfway around the world, where right now it's already tomorrow. So part of me is already in tomorrow, too. So I've already experienced the Super Bowl, and I know who wins. So Rams 31 to 24, just letting you know. <laughs> uh, but man, just so glad to be back. Had opportunity to go and to be in Indonesia where we had a uh, meeting with three of our p- partners there on the ground in Indonesia, Operation Mobilization, which is uh, we're trying to partner with them to start some churches over there. Also Mission Hope, who is in community development. And then She is Safe, one of the people in our church, one of the members of our church is part of that organization and where they deal in human trafficking. And so, uh, man, just heard some great stories, had great opportunities. There's so much different when you go around around the world, whether it's time zones or whether it's food or whether it's people or whether it's culture, just a lot of differences. Um, But there's a lot of things that are the same and a lot of commonalities that all people have. And one of the commonalities is this right here. Everybody likes to have a selfie with a white man. Because they, that was, uh, so this is a teacher in the school and three, uh, three girls who were in the school. And I don't even know that they know what this means, but that's the best they could come up with. So, um, but it was a great time to be away. And so, uh, but also great to just see what God's doing around the globe. And I'll be sharing a little bit uh, more about that in the coming days. Also great for Joe Baker to be able to speak for us, wasn't it? He did an awesome job. Yes, come on. One of the great things about our church, and you may be a guest, just to know about one of the great things about our church, one of our passions is to really see people developed and to really see people flourish and to see people step into the calling that God has given them. And the way to make that happen is just to have people give people opportunities. And you guys are so awesome um, to be able to give people opportunities to be so encouraging, so positive, to laugh at all the right places and all that kind of stuff. Just one thing I need you to know, all the stuff he said about me is not true. Uh, But outside of that, he did a great job. But thank you guys for being that kind of church because we really believe that what happens is more than what happens here, but it's how we're going to mobilize people to make a difference um, around the world and in the kingdom and not just in our time period, but also in the future for generations to come because we believe in the now generation, that it's not the next generation, it's the now generation. So um, that's just the kind of church that we are. And so today we are going to finish up the teaching portion around the more series. Now I say teaching portion is because we believe that more is not just a series, but, but it's more than that, no pun intended, that it's an expectation that we have of what God will do. It's the lenses through which we see the world, that we really believe that in everyone's life, God wants to do more, and that in the life of this church, Stone Creek Church, God wants to do more. We believe that we have the clarity of vision around elevating the name of Jesus, that we have the capacity for resourcing based on where we live and the affluence that we live in, that we need to embrace that, and also the conviction from God that there is more that he wants to do in our lives individually in the lives of our church. Now, generally, when we think of more, we think of more for me. We think of more for me. When I think of more, I think of more money, more stuff, more more comfort, more fun, more for me to consume. But when we look in the Bible, when we expect more, the kind of more that we expect is more for the mission. More for the mission. So we just want to unpack a little bit of that today as we finish up on this teaching series and just cast a little vision around your life and what we believe God wants to do in your life and what the capacity is for you to have influence, the capacity that we have, that we believe God has for you. Now, there are some of you here, you're new, you may be, you may be a guest. We're just glad that you're here. You're new here. Maybe you're just kind of understanding a little bit about who Jesus is and what it means to follow him. And some of you, um, you're in the journey, you're really early and some of you are a little further along but you haven't really made that step to follow him. So hopefully I can unpack for you today what that looks like because we always want to make talking about Jesus really easy. Like we want to make some of the stuff that we have bottom shelf. Sometimes bottom shelf gets a bad rap, but I think there are times when bottom shelf is good. And so we want to make it really easy and accessible for you. And then some of you are here and you've been around Jesus for a while and and we just want to really challenge you today. We want you to be challenged to step into the more that is a life of faith that means following Jesus. So let's grab our Bible. We're going to be in Ephesians chapter 3 today. Ephesians chapter 3. This is a passage we've been looking at. Now, if you're new, may always grab a paperback. That's what the page number 
number is for. There's a paperback in the back. You can grab a paperback, turn to that page, and you'll know where to read. Also, it's available on our app so that we can all read along together, and you can take it and read uh, uh, throughout the week as well because you never know what I might say, and so you always want to prove it by reading it for yourself. But we're in Ephesians chapter 3. Set a little context for where we are. In Ephesians, it's a letter that was written by a guy named Paul. Paul was a church starter, a church planter, a missionary. And Paul started churches in Ephesus and the surrounding region. And so Paul, after he had left those churches, he wrote letters back to them just to encourage them, to to give them some challenge, to maybe correct some things, but also just to kind of breathe life and pour some wind into their sails. So Paul has written this letter to the church in Ephesus, hence the name Ephesians. That's why it's called Ephesians. And so He is in the passage that we're looking at, it was a prayer that Paul had prayed for them. The two verses that we're going to look at right now are two verses that end the prayer that Paul is praying for them. So in Ephesians chapter 3, let's look in verse uh, 20. It says, Now to him, meaning Jesus, who is able to do far more abundantly than all that we ask or think, according to the power at work within us. Us. Hey, everybody, look at me right now. Within us. Hey, let's all do that together. Within us. The power is at work in you. It's not somebody else. It's not your neighbor. It's not for the professional. It's not for the stage. It's within all of us. This is the power to change the world. This is the power to carry the good news. This is the power to see lives transformed. It is planted deep within us. He says, according to the power that works within us, To him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever. Amen. So Paul Paul unpacks this idea of more, this sense of expectancy that he has that God's going to do more in that church. And this was the greatest church at this point in history because they were planting churches all over the world. And so Paul believed so deeply that God still wanted to do more in them. Now, when we look at that word more, we, we translated it, as you, read, as you read in your Bible, far more abundantly. But Paul would have taken, it was one word in the original language, which was Greek. That's not always important. It is right now. So the original language is Greek. So Paul, he, he couldn't come up with a word that meant what he really wanted to, to express, Paul was trying to describe the indescribable. So in the Greek, Paul took three words, he mashed them together, kind of shook them all up, rolled them out, and this is the word he came with. It, it looks a little bit like a casserole. You know what a, you know, you know what a cat, you're from the South, you know what a casserole is. You throw a bunch of junk in a pan, throw some cheese on top, and stick it in the oven for a little bit. Look, this is all the buffalo chicken dip is, by the way. Like, how many people love buffalo chicken dip for, come on, yes. I love buffalo chicken dip, especially for Super Bowl, because it's so healthy for you. And so, and so, and so but, but think about buffalo chicken dip for a minute. Like, so buffalo chicken dip is chicken, some cheese, and some other goodness from heaven, and then buffalo sauce. So basically what happened is they took a buffalo wing, they dipped it in blue cheese, threw some other cheese on top, and threw it in the oven. That's, that's exactly what they did. And so that you just mash it all together. Now, you could eat chicken, you could eat some cheese, and you could eat some buffalo sauce, but it is not the same. Amen? Not the same. You just melt it all together. This is what Paul has done. He has taken three words. He's mashed them together. But let me unpack the components of that word and the three different words that he, he used to put together. The first one just means personally, that God does a work in you personally for the sake of you is what it means. So everybody in this room, this means everybody. You have been given experiences. You've been given giftings. You've been wired a certain way. You have certain desires. You have certain likes and dislikes. God's put them all together for you to make impact. He has personally handcrafted you. The Bible says you are knit together personally. It's very personal how you're put together. You're very unique in the way that you're put together. And the reason why that is, is so that you can help someone understand what it means to have life in Christ. There's a saying that we have, and it goes like this, without you, someone could live without God. Without you, for those of us who follow Christ, this is the challenge time for us. Without you, someone could live without Christ. 
Think back to the person who invited you, who led you. Maybe it was your parents. Maybe it was a friend. But they were the one responsible for you finding this transformed life. See, there's someone out there right now walking around in darkness. They're walking around needing help. They're looking for something. They're searching. And you are the one that is created to lead them to the life that they can have in Jesus. Like, it may feel like a lot of responsibility, but what a privilege that you get to do something that will last throughout eternity. It's not over tomorrow or next week or next year. It goes on forever. I mean, you have this personal, this personal dignity and privilege to help someone know. And sometimes we forget that. Sometimes it falls off our radar. We get busy. And for some people, you have stopped believing that. I just want you to look right at me right now. Some of you have stopped believing that you can make a difference. You've stopped believing. You believe it's for somebody else. You believe, yeah, that's for my neighbor. That's for my spouse. That's for somebody else. It is for you. You think you've done something that's completely removed you from being able to have influence. I mean, you think something's been done to you. You think you're too far gone. You've made a mistake. I just want to tell you some good news this morning. If you're still breathing, God's not done with you. God has more to be done in you. That's the first piece of this word. The second piece means that it's outcome-oriented, that what's in you has got to land on somebody else, that eventually what's in you has got to come out of you, and it's got to land and have impact and influence on somebody else. Have you ever heard somebody say this, you know, my relationship with God or religion, that's, that's personal, Stephen. That's just between me and, and God. That's personal. And yes, it's personal, but it's never private. Never private. God has given us a faith and given us a command, a great commission to go in to tell people. And that what happens has to happen in your life is for you to be able to have an outcome on somebody else. We can go through life and we can say, well, I'm just going to serve people and hopefully I'm a good example. That is not enough. That is far short of what we see Jesus command us to do. God wants us to have an outcome on someone where they come to understand who he is. Like without someone to tell them, how will they know? How will they know? So it's outcome oriented. Like we're an outcome oriented kind of people, aren't we? we we're outcome driven. At your job, you are outcome oriented. If you're a parent, you're outcome oriented. You want your kids to grow up, to move out, to get a job, and support you in your old age. <laughs> you are outcome oriented. So this is an outcome that we get to have. It's personal how we're wired and created, but also there's this outcome where we get to have influence on somebody else. And then the third portion of this is that it's going to exceed expectations. Paul is so, he, he's so captured by the thought of what this could look like, that it's so far beyond anything he could ever dream of, that it exceeds expectations. It is beyond what you could think or ask, is how Paul says it. Exceeding expectations. Have you ever had your mind blown because your expectations got exceeded? Right? Let's see, maybe you went to a movie and you heard it was really good. And you're like, man, that blew my mind. That was amazing. Now, we've all been disappointed at a movie. Hello, Bohemian Rhapsody. Am I right? <laughs> what? We have an edge around here, just so you know. Now, um, like we all have been disappointed, but we also have been places that blew our mind, a restaurant, maybe when you got married or maybe when, maybe when you got a new job or maybe something that you bought, like exceeds expectations. It's beyond what you could think of. So this last week as I was flying, um, I was flying uh, a Delta subsidiary or Delta partner, um, Sky Team partner, Korean Air. And so I was flying Korean Air, and so as I'm coming home, um, whenever I came home, I don't even remember at this point, it was yesterday, and so th now just notice this, this is me boarding, so there's a guy standing here, he's looking at a list, and on that list are people's names that can go through what's the first class door on the left, or the economy class door that's on the right. Now, Stephen was flying economy class. And so my name was not on the first class door, and, and they didn't even want you to walk through first class because they knew they would never get you out of there if you'd ever flew. So I was flying economy, so all I could do was stand there and dream about what is in the first class door and think about how amazing it would be and how, how much it would exceed my expectations. 
Because I just knew in there, number one, you have a bed you can lay on. I knew that they were serving champagne and caviar to eat. And I knew that there was live entertainment. And in my mind, I believed that Justin Timberlake was in there singing. (laughs) That would have been something that would exceed your expectations. And so as we look at what Paul is saying, is that what God wants to do through you, what God wants to do in you to impact others, exceeds anything you could ever think or ask or dream of. Whatever you could think your purpose for being here, your reason for being here, the influence and impact that you could have, he he wants to blow our minds with more. And that is more of the mission. That's more of the mission. And God, in order for us to position ourselves with that, there are some things that we have to do. You know, we can't really force God's hand. I would love to be able to tell God, hey, you owe me, but he doesn't. I owe him. And what I owe God is my life. I owe God more. And I owe him more prayer. I owe him more of my finances. I owe him more of my marriage. I owe him more of my parenting. I owe him more of my job. I owe him more of everything because he can give me life. And he can give me something that will exceed my expectations that I can never achieve on my own. And so we want to be a people that positions ourselves to experience the more that God has, who has a, lives a life of faith and of risk and opportunity to be able to just step into the more that God has for us. You know, as we've unpacked that over the last month in three specific areas as a church that we just really want to step into. And, and the first area where we wanted to position ourselves to experience more was just, just more for us individually. And the way that we believe that that can happen is through what we call equip. It's through what we call equip. Now, equip is just our discipleship. And I'm going to explain that in just a second. Our discipleship method, the way that we believe that people can be trained, that people can be trained to look like Jesus. Now, a disciple is just someone who follows somebody else. They just learn from somebody else. They just they do the things that somebody else does, and that's how they live. So we a disciple, someone who follows Jesus, just does what Jesus would do. So who would Jesus be if Jesus were you? So think about it this way. So let's say that you're a stay-at-home mom, three kids, baby gates, child-proof houses, always having to undo the latches, nap time, not nap time, no sleep, some sleep. All the things that go in that life. Who would Jesus be if Jesus were that? If Jesus were you? Now, I know what you're thinking. You're thinking Jesus would be tired. But how would Jesus operate? How would he make decisions? How would he see the world? That's, that's what a disciple is. Who would Jesus be if Jesus were you? And so we want to help people be trained to do that. Three things specifically happen in Equip. Number one is we learn how to pray. We learn how to pray. We learn how to, how to read the Bible to see Jesus. And then the third thing I said, we learn how to tell people about him. Now, the way for you to be involved and equipped is to get in a group. I think we talked about that last week, maybe. Get in a group. And here's why this is so important. Your life will always reach a lid until you're surrounded by people who can help you break through. We've all had people in our lives that made us better. Maybe you had a teacher that you look back on. Maybe it was a coach Maybe for some of us, we were blessed with great parents who helped us elevate our lives. Your life will always hit a lid. You will always be short of what you want to be. You'll always feel this sense of restlessness until you're surrounded by other people who are for you. We live in a world that's so disconnected and and people are struggling so much. And we wonder why we're lonely and anxious and stressed out and depressed. It's because we don't have people around us who can help us lean into the more that God has for us. Listen, you need to be around other people. You're going to suffer and struggle and die. What Satan would like more than anything is to isolate you, divide and conquer. And in isolation, in isolation, you'll never reach what, the more that God has for you. We will believe everybody should be in some form of group, some form of community where they can be around other people. I can't begin to tell you the times when people have spoke life into me or corrected me and challenged me. And this is what Equip is designed to do. It helps you get in the game. It helps you get in the game. Nobody likes to sit on the sideline. No, like nobody likes to sit on the sideline. Maybe some of you were athletes and in, in school or, er, or earlier in some part of your life and you sat on the bench, you, you wanted nothing more than to get in the game. Or maybe you, were, maybe you didn't want to get in the game because you didn't feel like you were good enough. You know what you wished? You wished you were good enough so you could get in the game. We all want to be in the game. 
Tom Brady's backup wants to get in the game. He wants to get in the game. And the Rams want him to get in the game. (laughs) Nobody wants to sit on the sidelines. And equip is the way that you get in the game. So equip, number one way that we want to position ourselves to be able to experience the more that God has for us. Second thing that we're going to be about is church planting. So the thing about church planting, the reason why we would do this is because ch- and planting just means starting. I don't know where they got planting from. I'm sure some genius thought it's about a church is an organism, so we're going to use the word planting, and it just made everything confusing. But church starting, let's say that. So we want to be about that. Church starts have a better percentage of p- people that they reach who are, who are not following Jesus. They don't tend to attract as many people who are just coming from other churches. Now, an established church, we still do that, but sometimes our relational circles are already tied together, and sometimes we begin to start thinking about what's in it for us rather than what's in it for the world. And so starting other churches gives us an opportunity to be able to do that. Now, now, now we always have to be sure that we're about that mission, don't we? Because here's the mission of Jesus, just a couple of quotes from Jesus to be sure we're on the same page. Jesus said this, the son of man, referring to himself, he referred to himself as the son of man, came to seek and to save the lost. The lost just meaning people who don't know Jesus, who don't follow God. They're lost. That's what they mean. They're in darkness. They don't understand the true meaning of life. That's that's why he came. Those who were well have no need of a doctor, but those who are sick, I didn't come to call the righteous, but sinners, meaning everybody, because everybody is a sinner. But understanding, if you don't recognize that about yourself, you're not going to follow him. So Jesus was very clear on the mission, and so we need to be very clear on that. And I do believe that as a church, we can do a better job of that. Like one of the things I would hate to see is that for you to get to the end of your life and you were never part of someone you know coming to follow Jesus. That would be a tragedy. That would be a disaster in my mind. And I'm not saying that you have to walk out to the mall and say, hey, come here, can I tell you about Jesus and lead someone to the Lord right there. But part of serving people, inviting people, helping people, that through your efforts, someone came to know God. Like a lot of you have experienced that and you know what a privilege it is. Jesus' mission was people who were out there, so we want to be about that, the great commission of going and making disciples by starting churches. One of the areas we're going to focus our attention on is Belgium. Belgium is a part of the world that is considered unreached, unreached. Part of the reason is because they got away from making disciples, but we want to go to Belgium. Belgium is unreached. Belgium also is English-speaking. Belgium has a lot of opportunity there. People are open to the gospel. So we want to go and start a church there, at least one, and then we're going to see what God does. I believe that there are people in our church, maybe in this room right now, who God wants you, the more that God has for you, is to move to Belgium to help in this journey and to help in this adventure. With your job, you have opportunity to move. One of the beautiful things about living in our community is that people do have the ability to go and to move internationally. And as much as I would hate to see you leave, maybe this is what God's call is on your life, to go and to experience the more that he has for you and for your family. You know, we also know that we can't be willing to go across the ocean if we won't go across the street. Listen, you you don't go down and serve at Hope for Guatemala, then come back here and not tell your neighbors and not serve your neighbors or not serve your your, your classmates. You, you just That's not the way this works. Man, we, we're on mission everywhere all the time. So we have to be willing to go across the street. So realizing that, we just began to examine other, area, other areas in our city where maybe God would want us to go and plant another campus, another Stone Creek campus, something that is us. It is part of our staff, part of our culture, our staff culture, part of our language, part of who we are. And we identified the Sandy Springs perimeter area, that it's growing at the fast. It's, it's one of the only city. It is the only city in Georgia in the top 30 fastest growing cities in the United States. That it's one of the top 10 places for millennials to move. Millennials who the church is losing at an alarming rate. It has more Fortune 500 companies per capita than any city in the United States. So we're going to launch a campus in Sandy Springs. It's a Stone Creek campus. It will be part of our leadership, our staff, our culture, our people. It will be us just down there. And that's going to happen sometime next year. And so we believe that this is how we're going to position ourselves for more. Now, now some of you may ask, like, why would we do that? Like, why more? Because things seem to be going pretty good. Have you been around? 
Like, like attendance seems to be up, you know, dollars seem to be up. We're seeing people baptized. We're seeing people come to know Jesus. We're seeing people in groups. Like things seem to be good. Why would we do that? Because we believe that there's more. But I want to look at a story of a guy real quick as we, in these last few minutes we have together, who was experiencing success. But he knew, he knew that there was more. It's this guy named John the Baptist. How, how many of you guys have heard of John the Baptist? handful of you. Just for the record, he was not Southern Baptist. Just letting you know, because that, that is a point of con- contention there. And Because I grew up Southern Baptist, I can make fun. So, but John the Baptist was a guy who came to prepare the way for Jesus in John chapter 3. And John the Baptist just had this message. And John the Baptist was a rugged guy. He, he was rough around the edges. H- have you seen the revenant? Like the the character Hugh Glass played by Leonardo DiCaprio like this is who John the Baptist was Grizzly Adams kind of for you old schoolers you know who Grizzly Adams was John was rough around the edges and he just had this message repent the kingdom of God's at hand and he gained a following he had a lot of people that gathered around him and a lot of people that thought he was the man that wanted to learn from him so he gathered this crowd and what John the Baptist was doing why he was called the John the Baptist because he was baptizing people he was taking them in the Jordan River, dunking them under, and bringing them back up. Now, in, in those days, baptism had a couple of different p- potential meanings. Number one was just ceremonial. Like you would just be washing yourself in order to be clean before God. It was more symbolic. But, but the other meaning of baptism was as if it would, there was this threshold. And when you went in the water, you were one person. When you came out, you were changed. You were different. You were crossing over a threshold. And this was John's baptism. But there was some debate around it. In verse 28, it says this. Now, a discussion arose between, uh, uh, between some of John's disciples and a Jew over purification. In other words, they were having this baptism discussion. Like, what's your baptism mean? And is it ceremonial? Is it a threshold? What is it? And they came to John, and they said to John, this is his disciples coming back. They said, teacher, rabbi, he who was with you across the Jordan, in other words, Jesus, because John had just baptized Jesus. He says, that guy that was with you across the Jordan, to whom you bore witness, look, he is baptized, and all are going to him. So do you see what's happening here? John has a crowd. He has a following. Some of his disciples come and say, hey, John, come here. There's a guy over there, and and other people are going over there now. Like, like we we should be worried. Because they're not following you anymore, they're following him. And what emerges in that moment is competition. And John's disciples aren't sure how to handle this competition that's happening. And John, who's successful and leading a movement, All of a sudden, competition happens. What do you do when there's competition? And you double down. Now, now, we we know a little bit about competition in our culture, don't we? We know a little bit about competition. Can you say Super Bowl? But beyond that, we're all competitive, aren't we? Are you just a little bit competitive? How about when you play board games? Are you just a little bit competitive? Like, like I always say that that I don't like board games, but it's not. That's not true. I don't like what board games do to me. That's what I don't like. <laughs> Just a quick example of that. So, so it, you know, my two favorite words are we win. I'm, you know, we all know that. So w- there was this one time when one of my kids was playing travel ball and we were traveling overnight. And so, you know, when you do that, you get with some families and you may play a board game or two. And so we got our families together and we were playing spoons. Anybody played spoons before? You got it. Okay, so here's how spoons goes. Spoons, basically, is you have some cards and you're passing them around. And whoever has four cards, you're going to get to win. There are spoons in the middle of the table where all contestants can reach them. As soon as you get four, you grab a spoon. Now, when you see someone else get a spoon, you better get a spoon. And you grab a spoon. Now, the problem is there's, there's one less spoon than players. So someone's not going to get a spoon. And if you don't get a spoon, guess what? You lose. Now, my favorite words are what? You, we, I win. So I'm playing and we're playing and it's getting down to the last three and it's me and two 10-year-old little girls. <laughs> and so all of a sudden we go around. I see one of them reach for a spoon. I grab a spoon and I yank it close to me and the little girl starts crying. I'm like, shut up. You shouldn't have played with me. 
And then I realized, I opened my hand to look at my spoon, and she wasn't crying because she didn't get the spoon. She was crying because I'd yanked her pinky off, and it was in my hand <laughs> with pink fingernail polish on her little fingernail. That really didn't happen. But I'm just competitive, man. We're all competitive. We all want to win. So this is the environment where John is, and all of a sudden his disciple says, you're losing. You're losing. How does John handle that? So John says this, a person can't receive even one thing unless it's given him from heaven. You yourselves bear witness that I have always said I'm not the Christ, but I've been sent before him. The one who has the bride is the groom, and the, one who, and the friend of the groom who stands and hears him rejoices at the groom's voice. Therefore, this joy of mine is now complete. Why? He must increase, I must decrease. Some people believe these are the greatest seven words written in the Bible, that he must increase. See, John knew the name of the game. John knew that it wasn't about him, that it was about Jesus. John knew that his life existed to elevate the name of Jesus, that he had to withdraw so that Jesus could be lifted up. We all increase something in our lives. We're all holding something up. But listen, it better be able to deliver what we want. And what we read in the Bible, what we see in the life of Jesus is that he can deliver. Jesus can deliver. Anyone who can be raised from the dead can deliver. This is the story of the gospel. This is the message that we have. That we were all wayward and searching. That we had broken away from God. And God wanted us to come back home, so he sent Jesus for us. And that Jesus came and poured out his life for us. Served us, gave his life as a ransom for us. He didn't power up. And when he gave his life as a ransom, as we follow him, we experience the life. Man, this is counterintuitive, but, but what happens when we decrease and Jesus increases, we actually step in to the more that God has for us. Listen, there's some areas in your life that you need to decrease. For some of you, it's your marriage. What happens when you increase in marriage? What happens? Conflict happens. When you want to be right, when you want to be in control, when you want to be in charge, usually conflict happens. What happens when you begin to serve, when you begin to quit worrying about your rights, begins to flourish? Some of us, there's just areas in our life where we need to decrease, we need to step back. This is the message that we have. Now, there are some things that I've discovered that are universal beyond a selfie. And it's the message of hope. And I sat across the table from girls, young girls, who'd been sold into prostitution. But they'd been rescued. They'd been restored. I sat across from one girl whose dad had abused her, who'd been sold into prostitution, who on February the 21st was going back to be reconciled to the same man that sold her. That's the power of the gospel. And it's universal. And what would it look like when we begin to see our world that way? Like, how does it change how you see your workplace? That it's not just a job where you can earn a paycheck, but it's a place where you can go and influence and make a difference. How does it change how you see your neighborhood, where you work, where you live? It's not just a place I go home to relax, but a place where God has me to be able to navigate and to connect with people who may need something. It's a game changer. Like, this is the more that God has for us. And as we increase him and as we step away and decrease, this is how we stay focused on what God has for us. You know, there's a letter written about this church in Ephesus over in the book of Revelation. The, kind of the last book of the Bible. The last thing we see written about it. And this letter ha has these words in it. And it, it's a letter from God to this church. And he says this, I have this against you, that you have abandoned the love you had at first. That you abandoned the love you had at first. Let that never be said of us. But when I think of a letter that's written to our church, I penned a few words, just what I would hope would be said about us. Stone Creek was a church of faith, real, living, active faith. 
They took responsibility for what needed to be done. Their faith showed up when obstacles emerged and it opened doors for those who were lost. Their faith didn't get bogged down in the difficulties and didn't glory in the false bravado that's mistaken for faith. They really believed that God could do more than they could ask or think that he could. They were a church of fun. They believed that Jesus was a God of laughter and offered life. And what is life without laughter? What is life without the opportunity to enjoy it? They believed that the kingdom of heaven would be fun, and they cherished the description of heaven as a celebration. They knew that in heaven many may laugh as they told funny stories about them, but they embraced the idea of laughing and celebrating moments of victories and even the simple good times of a good meal, a good song, or a good conversation. They were a church focused on the fundamentals. Stone Creek never got away from one simple truth. Jesus loves me, this I know. While there are more complicated problems that they didn't address, they never were embarrassed to stick to the basics. They knew that the simplicity of the gospel is what everybody needs. Basics tell the story. Basics win a lot of games. Basics keep elevating the name of Jesus throughout generations. They were a church who wanted others to flourish. They poured out their lives for others. They helped others. They went across the ocean and they walked down the street. Stone Creek was a church that fought for relationships so that others could find hope in Jesus. They had grand celebrations for people who moved closer. They believed in people when people couldn't believe in themselves. When most people could have overlooked something in someone that would hold them back, Stone Creek took the risk to show them how Jesus could change it all. And those people turned the world upside down because of it. Let's pray. Yeah. So God, help us to be a people that stays focused on the mission. That we would never settle for it being about us. We just recognize it's about others. And no matter what that it's about others. And God, for those who may be hurting today and may who have just kind of taken a step on, sit on the bench, God, today they get back in the game. That wherever they are, they would take a step to get back in the game. God, I pray for those who don't know you in this room. God, we just have a sense of expectation that people are going to come to know you, even on our Sunday morning services. God, that people are going to step into life in Jesus. They're going to begin to follow you. They're going to begin to ask for forgiveness of sin. They're going to be transformed and changed. God, we just have a sense of expectancy. This is what you want to do. And we just want to be a part of it. God, I pray that we would never want our own way, our own comfort, our own place, our own anything. God, that we would always just search for the more that you have for us. God, I pray for the places where we're going to go into whether it's Belgium or whether it's Sandy Springs or anything, anywhere else, God, that we would just go into it with faith. But while we we may not always be clear and we would always be certain, and God, we would be certain that we were following you to take a risk, that it wasn't about the outcome, but it was about doing what you asked us to do. God, I pray for those who need to get in a group today who have a question about it, God, that they would quit making excuses, that they would quit Uh, letting other things take priority over the one thing that may could change them more than anything this year. And I pray that they would get in a group, God. And Lord, I just pray that you take these words that were spoken, which were a lot of them, and you would just use them and that people would hear what you wanted them to hear and they would filter out what you did. And Lord, we just pray that, that Jesus was highlighted and lifted up in our time together. It's in his name that we pray. Amen.